recording back. <laughs> uh, uh, so really to just provide a lot of insight uh, that might be helpful. So it, this is gonna be a little bit different than our normal webinar in that there's not a presentation per se, um, but you still will have the opportunity to ask questions. So feel free if you have any questions to type those in the Q&A and then you know, when we get to the end, just like we normally do, I will uh, moderate that part of the discussion. Um, and before I uh, hand it over to you, David, um, just gonna do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, for those of you who are on here, um, just, just a reminder that we have another webinar coming up on Thursday at 12.30. Um, and that webinar uh, is concerning taxes, accounting, and legal issues. So the taxes and accounting is gonna kind of focus on the things you need to do to get your business set up the, the right way for you later so that you don't have issues with 280E and all of the other uh, tax and accounting issues that are specific to a cannabis-based business. And then the legal piece is really about, you know, what's some things you can be doing right now uh, from a legal perspective while we all wait for licenses to be distributed. So um, wanted to put that out there. And then I will be posting another webinar. It is not on our website yet. I am going back and forth. Um, this one is gonna be in December. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Obviously, when, as soon as we get it up, I'll be sending an email out. That one is gonna be on hiring specifically for cannabis-based business. So if you remember the HR sessions we did previously, those were all very general and broad about all the things you need to know to be hiring in general and to be in compliance with um, employment law. But there are some things specific to cannabis-based businesses. So I have a consultant who specifically specializes in recruiting for cannabis businesses. Um, she's out of Chicago. And so their organization um, does that as their business. And she's going to be sharing information about that. That's going to be coming up in December. I will be getting that date to you um, probably in the next week. So that's all the housekeeping I have. Uh, so I will hand it over to you, David. I will mute myself. So give you free reign. Thanks, Trisha. I appreciate the uh... The introduction and and uh, by the way, for everybody who's on here, this is such a terrific. I mean, you already know this is such a terrific resource. Um, great stuff, and you know this is what we're gonna. What I'm gonna talk about today in terms of the uh, the licenses and and uh, the delays and the litigation and and where we're at right now. Um, the other stuff that Trisha was talking about coming on Thursday and next week is just as important because. One of these days, licenses are going to be issued, and hopefully, everybody on this uh, webinar will be will be included in that. And even if you're not, it's still good to know for future reference. This isn't a this isn't a sprint, right? This is a long term uh, marathon, and so I suspect a lot of you, even if you're not in the initial um, round of licenses issued, you're either going to stick it out and try again next year, which is coming very soon. Uh, and there's also ancillary uh, cannabis businesses that, that are out there, lots of them out there to get involved with. So there's a lot going on and this uh, organization provides a lot of good information. So um, I was, as Tricia mentioned earlier, we, we, we spoke about uh, my involvement in uh, part of the litigation with respect to the licenses and the holdup of the licenses. And what I'm gonna do today is go back and, and talk to you about you know, it's really broken up into two, uh, similar to the applications, two different sections, right? We got the dispensary licenses, which the applications were, were came off first before the, the growers and the infusers, and they were supposed to have been uh, awarded. The, the licenses were supposed to have been stored and awarded initially. Um, and then the craft grower and the infuser applications came up subsequently and were also supposed to have been awarded, sort of an award um, after that. And, and they really, so they've kind of taken two different tracks. <clears throat> so initially, um, as you're probably all aware, um, the dispensary license uh, stores came out and this was in uh, September, actually, August, late August. <laughs> 
with the timing is, is strange these days uh, with everything we're going through. So it's hard, hard to remember. But definitely the first lawsuit that was filed uh, that came out of the dispensary scoring uh, was early September. It was the first week of September. That was the uh, South Shore store case in federal court in Illinois. And many of you may have been paying attention and, and already know this, uh, that case was filed because um, when, <laughs> when people started hearing about and receiving their scores, um, there were clearly some issues. Uh, there were issues with the scoring, there were issues with lack of transparency, there were issues with uh, applicants not information um, the information that was received was uh, sometimes inconsistent. Uh, there were questions about the uh, 21 applicants who all tied for the perfect scores uh, and what the makeup of those teams looked like. And so there were a lot of questions. And I'll go back to something Tricia said. Actually, I'm not sure she said in the intro or something I've talked to her about it before, but um, the lack of transparency and communication that has been with us now during this process, really since day one. I mean, it's certainly since the, um, the law came out and, and then the complex application process and then following the application submittals, the, the, the delay in the scoring and, and uh, it's just, it's been troubling, it's been challenging um, and so that also added to, uh, to a lot of the issues. But so the first lawsuit that was filed um, basically said, look, um, judge, uh, we have all these, these hundreds of applicants, not the 21 that actually received perfect scores, but the hundreds of others that some did receive scores, some didn't receive scores. But what we can tell you is that a number of applicants um, didn't have the same opportunities that the others did or some others did to actually uh, complete their uh, deficient exhibits. And the, you know, it's, I'm sure you're all aware that the process included a, an opportunity for the IDFPR, the agency that oversees the, uh, the scoring and the, and the licensing of uh, dispensary licenses uh, to issue deficiency notices where certain exhibits were deemed by uh, the department, to actually technically deemed by KPMG, uh, who, was, who was doing the scoring, uh, to be deficient. That is not receiving the full possible score for a particular exhibit. And some deficiency notices went out during the course of scoring, um, but apparently, deficiency notices didn't go out for every exhibit that didn't score a perfect score. And so the argument that was made in this initial case was um, there are due process violations, equal protection violations, a number of constitutional issues um, related to the failure of the IDFPR and KPMG in scoring to actually give fair, full and fair opportunity to applicants to correct and supplement their scores, uh, their exhibits that didn't receive perfect scores. So uh, as you may know, I'm, we, we, I won't get deep into the, the legalities of the weeds here, but um, that set of plaintiffs, which, which eventually reached, I believe a total of about 75 applicants um, as plaintiffs in that case, uh, were asking the court to um, stop the lottery process uh, from happening, that lottery process, which was going, going to award um, licenses, the 75 licenses to the 21 perfect scoring applicants. The lawsuit asked the, the court to stop that with a temporary restraining order. Um, and before the judge could rule on that request for the TRO to stop the lottery process, uh, the state and the plaintiffs reached a settlement. And what that settlement looks like, I mean, technically uh, we're not gonna see the settlement, but if you go onto the IDFPR website, uh, what you will see is an announcement dated, I believe it's September 22nd, 
Uh, it's about a three page document that identifies uh, what the state, the IDFPR came up with as uh, a resolution in their eyes. And that resolution was a supplemental deficiency notice process. That did away with the lawsuit, the South Shore lawsuit. That case was dismissed voluntarily. Um, and we are now sitting here today uh, with that process that was uh, born out of this litigation. Uh, before I get into further into that supplemental deficiency process, um, I will say also there were a few other lawsuits that were filed. Uh, one other in federal court, which I'm not even sure is still pending, but isn't going to have, have an effect um, for various reasons. There was, uh, and still is one in, in Sangamon County Circuit Court, that state court in Springfield. Uh, and then there's another one that is still pending in the Circuit Court of Cook County in Chicago, Illinois. Um, the one in Sangamon County deals with uh, a different issue, similar, but different related to the requirement to, not requirement, but uh, one of the um, exhibits for the dispensary licenses, um, which is the veteran owned exhibit. And so the argument that's being made there is essentially um, in order to receive a perfect score, the applicant needed to be, as it turned out, uh, veteran owned. And so there's an argument, again, this is in Sangamon County, Circuit Court that, again, more uh, constitutional arguments, due process, equal protection type claims that uh, it's not appropriate to require applicants to have a veteran owned company uh, in order to obtain a license, uh, a dispensary license. Um, that argument's gonna be kicking around for a little bit. I know they're in the middle of some briefing on, on uh, responding to the complaint. Litigation can take, can take a long time. I mean, sometimes I've been a litigator for almost 30 years now and, and um, you know, some, some of my, my bigger and more complex cases can just go on for years. Uh, obviously we don't have years uh, for, these, for these licenses, which were due to be awarded months and months ago. Um, but that particular issue is, is gonna take a little bit longer. Uh, so we're watching that, that's still pending. Um, could that have an issue? Could that have a, uh, a ripple effect depending on the decision? Yes, but unlikely and not as, and not as important as um, this supplemental deficiency notice, which we're gonna talk about uh, in a second here. More important is that after that settlement and after that issuance of this supplemental deficiency notice by the IDFPR, uh, and probably not surprising, it wasn't surprising at the time, but some of the 21 perfect scoring lottery winners uh, who are expecting to uh, take part in this lottery process that was going to award the 75 licenses, uh, weren't too happy with that result. Uh, they weren't happy with the fact that, you know, they put time into this application, just, to, just like all the other applicants. <clears throat> they put effort, they put money, uh, they waited, they received perfect scores, and now they were being told by the state that they were gonna have to not only wait for the lottery process, but also have to uh, potentially uh, be in that lottery process with other applicants that initially didn't score perfect scores, but we're going to get a rescore under this supplemental deficiency notice. So they filed a lawsuit. <laughs> uh, they filed a lawsuit initially in the Illinois Supreme Court. Uh, there were at the time there were several, several of the 21 perfect scoring applicants uh, that joined together as plaintiffs. There is a provision of the law that allows them based on the claims that they're making to go directly to the Illinois Supreme Court, uh, which they did on a request that the Supreme Court issue uh, a writ of mandamus, which is a fancy way of saying compelling the state to do what is otherwise obligated to do under the law, uh, which is to conduct the lottery. 
and to do so immediately and, and to not wait for this supplemental deficiency round. So um, as part of that procedure and going directly to the Illinois Supreme Court, uh, the Illinois Supreme Court has the option to uh, not hear the case. <laughs> it's, a, it's essentially initially a request that the Illinois Supreme Court hear it. Uh, the Supreme Court has the, the option to hear it or not hear it. Um, and in this case, after several weeks of reading briefs, the Illinois Supreme Court decided they didn't want to hear it and they didn't want to decide it and they punted. So there was no ruling on that issue initially from the Illinois Supreme Court. And frankly, they don't have to give any, uh, a reason and they didn't. So that was um, several weeks of, of uh, waiting with essentially no results there. Um, and what those plaintiffs did was they then went, because there hadn't been any substantive ruling by the Illinois Supreme Court on this particular issue, they went to the circuit court in Sangamon County, Springfield, Illinois, with the same argument. Uh, and they filed a new lawsuit in the circuit court, that's a state court, and the new argument was the same as the one that they made to the Illinois Supreme Court, which is there's an obligation to hold this lottery process. We score perfect scores and you should absolutely do that immediately with, and without delay. Um, but before you make that decision, judge, we want you to enter a temporary restraining order that uh, prohibits the state from going forward with this supplemental deficiency notice round. So that's what was uh, most recently before the circuit court. And you may have heard uh, late last week, I believe it was Thursday, uh, the judge in that case issued a ruling. Uh, and the ruling was that the temporary restraining order was denied and that the state was, as a result, um, free to go forward with their supplemental deficiency notice. The court was not going to prohibit that. Um, and now what's before the court remains this, uh, again, mandamus claim that the state should proceed with the lottery the IDFPR should proceed with the lottery process. Um, but stay tuned on this one because what happens in cases where there's a temporary restraining order requested up front is you get a lot of substance of the case put before the court quickly and initially, and you get rulings, oftentimes very substantive rulings, like in this case, if you read the order from, from last week, a substantive ruling that gives you a real good understanding and idea of how the court's gonna rule ultimately <clears throat> on the underlying issue. So we'll see, um, the court didn't seem too, too keen on, on the request for the mandamus, uh, but they haven't ruled on it yet. They could still rule on it. All they've done so far is to say that the state may proceed uh, in due course with its supplemental deficiency notice. So that's where we're at right now. If any of you are interested in what's going on with the uh, dispensary, process, again, you can go to the IDFPR website and you'll see this uh, September 22nd notice to applicants, well, to the public, that says for any applicant who didn't score um, a perfect score on a particular exhibit, you will receive a supplemental deficiency notice. It doesn't say when, we're still waiting for some timeline. Um, could happen today. It could happen in 2021. We're not sure yet. Um, one thing that it does say is that it will post, the IDFPR will post additional detail about this process on their website in the coming weeks. Um, for anybody paying attention and listening to all the public official statements and, and things that have been, been uh, broadcast out there in the media, um, in the coming weeks has become a, a, a common theme for, for the state and our officials. And when they don't have a specific deadline or a date by which they're gonna do something, we hear in the coming weeks. So that can mean, as I said, later today, it could mean next month, it could mean next year. We don't know yet. But what we're anticipating is that there will be some additional information before you receive a deficiency notice. Um, that's not for sure. So do keep your eye, eyes out for the supplemental deficiency notice. And what they've also told us is when you receive that supplemental deficiency notice, you have an option. 
you should receive that for any exhibit that you didn't receive a full score on. And you can, within 10 days of receipt of that deficiency notice, just like the other deficiency notices, you can respond by supplementing that particular exhibit. So that's one option. Another option that the IDFPR has given you, and you, again, you can see this on the, on the actual document, um, is they will actually review and rescore to the extent that you think there are inconsistencies in the scoring, uh, which is a little unusual, and I'm looking forward to hearing how they're going to procedurally do this, uh, but presumably you will be able to submit your application uh, and your scores and ask the IDFPR to look at, here are some inconsistencies. For example, um, we applied in two different regions. We, we wrote the same thing for exhibit X, um, not exhibit X, but you know, whatever exhibit you're, 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 you're pointing to, and we received different scores in those different regions. I think that to me is an inconsistency with the scoring. And based on what I read in this uh, supplemental deficiency notice round, um, is that the department will review those inconsistencies and presumably rescore to the extent they deserve some rescoring. One thing we don't know is who's going to be doing this review and rescoring. To date, it's been KPMG. We've heard a lot about KPMG in the news, uh, but what we don't know is whether or not the rescoring and the supplemental deficiency notices um, will be issued from KPMG, will be going back to KPMG, or will really just be in the hands of the department. Uh, we'll see. Uh, they haven't announced. Time will tell. Um, we'll find out. Um, and then the other option is you can do nothing. You can just sit in and have your, your application um, as it was scored um, stay the way it is. It's, there all, are already, as we're aware, um, 21 applicants with perfect scores. So it appears that in order to, if you're not already uh, uh, an applicant with a perfect score, in order to get into the lottery process, which there will be because there are ties, um, you will need to have a perfect score. Unless something changes, that's where we sit today. Um, so that's um, procedurally, procedurally, that's where we sit. And as I said, uh, with, the, with the dispensary applications, um, we don't know the timing. Uh, we don't know really the process, but we know generally what the state is going to do. So I, um, I know that there are gonna be questions um, and I know questions will be taken and Trisha will monitor those and, and definitely ask questions to the extent you have them. And I will ha happily answer uh, any and all. Um, I also want to encourage you to stay in touch with um, what's going on. You can do that through Trisha. You can do that through, through me. I'm happy to, you know, I regularly get emails with people asking me what's going on, any new news, keep me updated. I have a list of folks that I, um, um, update regularly with, with things that are happening. So uh, stay in touch because these things are going to happen eventually and they're going to happen probably pretty fast. Um, so I actually have a couple of questions that came up as you were talking that people might be curious about. Um, so maybe before we segue into the next topic, can we cover those questions now? Yeah. And the next topic will be the craft grower and the infusers. Yep. So, so, everyone's yep. so the couple of questions that I had just as you were talking, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, and, and I'm not as well versed on a, a dispensary application as I am on the others because that process was already done by the time, you know, the CEO um, put out there for assistance. So um, wasn't the veteran owned option supposed to be an optional like extra credit, extra bonus points type of thing originally or no? Not technically bonus points. Okay. Um, optional, yes. Meaning um, theoretically, it wasn't supposed to preclude you from, from obtaining a license, right? So you didn't have to be 
uh, a veteran owned applicant to receive a license. It was an optional exhibit. Um, and that's really the basis of the lawsuit that's pending in Sangamon County, which is, guess what? It turned out not to be optional because in order to actually get into the lottery process, in order to receive a license, it turns out you had to be veteran owned. And that wasn't part of the process. That wasn't the intent of the legislature when they, when they created the law. Um, and so, so I don't want to, so there's no confusion. confusion. They aren't bonus points per se, because there are actually two bonus points um, for those that tie with perfect scores of 250, but they are optional. Gotcha. Well, they were supposed to be optional. They were supposed to be optional. So, which actually leads to one of the questions that's in the Q&A. So if you don't have a veteran, you can't get a perfect score. So the answer to that is obviously, now Now that they've finished the scoring, the answer to that is, that's accurate. <laughs> yes, as we sit here today, that is accurate. Well. Actually, let me be clear. Um, without veteran points, you cannot get a perfect score. Perfect score meaning 100%. Right. Um, I think, in theory, I think the idea was you wouldn't need a perfect score. You wouldn't need 100% to obtain a license, to be awarded a license. I don't think that was the intent, mm -hmm. uh, but that is the way it turned out. Okay, I think there's a follow up from Wendy, but what if that lawsuit about veterans takes longer than other rulings? Yeah, and it's very likely that it will. Um, what if is a good question. I, I, I don't know the answer because it's going to cause some, some issues, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it, um, and there are, look, um, it is on the, at the top of the radar for the legislature uh, who will not be meeting uh, until January or February, but um, it is it is at the top of the list to uh, revise for future rounds. Um, not that vet, veterans aren't important and shouldn't be, you know, it was, an, it was a, the intent was a good one um, to include additional points and to, to give some, some um, benefit to veteran owned companies. Um, but the intent wasn't to, to require that or to preclude those that aren't. Um, so to the, to the question, um, we don't know yet. Um, it probably will take longer than, than at certainly the first round of deficiency notices, I'm sorry, the supplemental round of deficiency notices and then potentially the lottery process. Uh, the state has not announced yet, and I don't expect that they will, whether or not they will proceed with the lottery process, even if that veteran case is, is still pending. We'll see. Okay. They may try to settle it or resolve it somehow like they did with the, with the South Shore case, uh, but that's a, it's a real challenge. It's gonna be a tough one. Okay, and then um, the next question that's in chat, and I do have a question after this one is, how will the deficiency notices be delivered to the applicant? Will they use the portal? Will they mail or email? Yeah, great question. And again, another reason to, to, to stay in touch. Um, we don't know yet. Um, they, the state has seemed to, and this is, this is just my feeling from everything that's, that's been going on uh, in my involvement, they seem to be wanting to move away from the KPMG secure portal system. Um, but, but, but they, that, having been set up, uh, they may just continue to use that system, but we don't know. And again, I mentioned that if you look at their, at the IDFPR's uh, description of the supplemental deficiency notice round, um, they state that they are going to have more detail about how it's going to work before it actually takes place. So we're anticipating what's gonna happen is in any minute, um, we're going to see an update on the IDFPR website, an announcement will go out, here's how it's going to work. Sometime in the next X period of days, you will receive and then they'll explain it. It's either going to be another KPMG secure portal uh, email, um, like they did in the prior rounds of deficiency notices, or maybe it will just be an email from the Department of uh, IDFPR uh, or some other state um, email agency. We don't know yet. 
Okay. Uh, okay, there's a question, follow-up question in the chat and I'll ask um, Wendy or anybody who has follow-up questions as your question is being asked to please put it in the Q&A, but I'll go ahead and read this. What has to happen for Illinois to allow non-veteran perfect scores to have some advantage or discount in the next round? The law needs to be changed. <laughs> yeah, and, and, so, and not, so, not necessarily that exhibit, right, or those points. Um, it can be done in, in various ways. And we, I'm hoping, I trust that the legislature will put their their uh, thinking hats on and uh, figure out, you know, the best ways to go about this. Um, but this way doesn't work, right? I mean, we, we've seen that. There are, and look, we knew that. We knew that going in. I, I had, we talked a year and a half ago when the law came out, we knew there were going to be challenges. Uh, we knew there were going to be hurdles. We knew that in a competitive, restrictive, uh, you know, cannabis license state that we're in, when you have this type of um, restrictive uh, um, scheme, there are going to be challenges. And so now we know what they are, um, some of which we, we didn't predict and, and the legislature didn't predict and the agencies didn't predict, but now we know. And so now they need to be revised and that's gonna cause some delay as well, right? I mean, the, the legislature isn't gonna meet again until next year. Um, I, it's going to be at the top of their, their agenda, but once that's done, uh, listen, I, I, I hope we all hope that we can get through this initial round, uh, licenses can get issued as soon as possible. And then we can start with the next round with a better structure as soon as possible next year. And my thought process, as soon as you said that, well, the law would need to be changed. Part of it, then my response to that is. So it probably would be helpful for those of you who are waiting and have been impacted by this to contact your local state representative and state senator to be able to say, this is the impact that this has had and this, and this is the impact that this has had on me as a voter in your district. Yeah, great point. Mm -hmm. Because, and, and I just say that because of, uh, I happen to have a, a pretty good relationship with both my state senator and state representative. Um, and if I call them and say, you know, this is a problem and this is what how you can help, that's gonna get, I think, much more traction and much more visibility from them than any idealist thing that they can't wrap their heads around. So if you have a relation, if you don't have a relationship with them, this is a great time to get one <laughs> and to make those phone calls. Yeah, and also if you don't know, like you know, not every representative in your in your jurisdiction is directly involved, um, but there is a uh, committee that is directly involved. And so, you know, if you want names, um, I'm happy to to throw them out there to you or, or give them to Tricia. But um, there are specific representatives that are that are dealing with this right now. I mean, they're meeting weekly now so that they're prepared uh, and there's a lot of work to do so hopefully they're they're doing their work so the next question we have is kind of a hypothetical do you think if illinois passed this as a referendum instead of law it would have solved a lot of this hmm. um good question i mean i think the, the ultimately the law itself the details the structure of it, it still needs to be regardless of how it's past um, created by the legislature. Um, so I'm not sure that the way it was passed really made a, a difference to uh, what we're dealing with right now. Okay. And then um, the next question is, when is the ICCA returning to court and will we be able to view the hearing again? That's jumping ahead. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> but that is, but that is, uh, that is a discussion that we're going to have right now with uh, the craft grower and infuser. So, okay, I have one follow up. So then I'll leave that question open That's and right. I'll have one follow up question on the previous topic, which was you brought up the a specific example of inconsistencies in scoring. Has there actually been 
um, actual examples of that happening? Like, do we know of someone that that's happened to where they were scored differently in two different regions? Yes. Wow. Um, we know from, well, we know from, first of all, uh, the pleadings in the initial South Shore case mm -hmm. resulted in this settlement. Uh, my recollection, and I don't remember the specifics, but I do recall that there were examples of that. Um, so some of those plaintiffs named in that lawsuit had inconsistent scoring in different regions. Mm. I can tell you from personal experience, I, I worked with uh, applicants on, on both the dispensaries and craft grows, and um, I have client applicants uh, for dispensary licenses that received inconsistent different scores for the same exhibits in different regions, submitted in different regions. So it did happen. I don't know the extent of it. Right. Uh, I don't know if it happened to 80% or 10%. But, but one is bad enough. <laughs> That's all it takes. And we know mm -hmm. it's more than one. So Right, right, right. Okay. And okay, listen, so there's 4,500 plus applications over 17 different regions. So it's, um, it's unfortunate that it happened, but it needs to be cleaned up and, and it needs to be done correctly. Absolutely. Okay, well then um, we have no more questions on the dispensary topic. So let's uh, go the sure. next time. So, right, and as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, there were really two tracks here. There was the original dispensary, not original, but the primary uh, dispensary applications. And then the craft grows and the infusers and the transporters followed that a uh, few months behind uh, with the deadline to submit the applications earlier this year. Um, and then the deadline to receive our scores and our licenses for the craft grows and infusers by July 1st. Um, horrible timing, right, with our pandemic. And look, a lot of this, uh, we haven't really talked about it much, but um, a lot of this delay, uh, whether it's delays from the courts, delays from the scoring, delays from uh, announcements from the departments, the agencies, the state, a lot of it, a lot of it did result uh, or come as a result of our challenges with the pandemic. Um, and a lot of it is just being blamed on that as well, but, uh, but we do have this challenge and it, and it was really bad timing, um, unfortunately for all of us. Um, mostly so though, for the craft growers and the infusers who had an additional obligation, at least one additional obligation that the dispensary applicants did not. I mean, that was to secure property. And the, the, the challenge, which any, any uh, craft grower or infuser applicant is well aware of, um, is that when you secured your property, whether it was through a purchase agreement or a, a lease, uh, presumably they were, hopefully they were contingent upon receiving a license. Um, I suppose there may have been some folks that just bought the property or just entered into a long-term lease, but for the most part, um, what we're hearing is most everyone entered into contingent deals. Um, and so certainly if you didn't receive a license on July 1st, you wouldn't want to go forward and purchase the property or lease the property. So because it's, it's expensive. Um, but July 1st was the deadline. July 1st was the, the mandated deadline. It was in the statute. It still is in the statute. It was decided by the legislature back when they uh, an activist law that July 1st would be the deadline by which craft growers and infusers would have their scores and their licenses. And so when the applicants um, secured their properties and submitted their applications back in February, March, maybe even, it may have, may have even been delayed into April, um, the idea was that they would know by July 1st. And when the governor uh, extended the deadline indefinitely suspended, it's the term they used in his executive order um, on June 29th, that caused a lot of problems for the craft growers and the infusers um, with respect mostly to the property. 
because in order to secure property and to hold that property, you need to give the owner something and that's usually money. So it has cost now um, applicants who are securing property and having to continue to pay money for property that they may not ever need because they don't receive a license um, through July, August, September. It's almost five months from July 1st. And uh, that's real money. Um, some, sometimes it's not even money. Sometimes it's just an inability, complete inability to, to maintain, to hold that property because the seller or the landlord isn't willing to keep it out off the market for that long, irrespective of how much you're willing to pay them. Uh, so th there are those challenges as well. And of course, this all goes back to the, the main issue, um, which is that the Cannabis Regulation and Tax Act specifically states that if you apply, whatever's on your application when you apply needs to be consistent with whatever your, your situation is when you get the license. So if you applied in a March with you know, 123 Main Street as your secured property, you better be holding that property uh, come July 1st, otherwise you're not going to be able to get your license. Well, July 1st came and went, and now we're at November or whatever the date is, 15, 16, 17, and you still need to be holding that license. And that's, that's, that's what really has caused, sorry, you still need to be holding that property um, so that someday when eventually the Department of Agriculture issues the licenses, um, you're able to get the license because you're still holding that property. This was kind of the impetus for applicants and what, what really created this, um, this association, the Illinois Craft Cannabis Association, um, which is made up of members that are applicants. Certainly there aren't any licenses issued yet. So it's just the applicants right now. Um, and I got to speaking with um, the principals of that association and, and we said, you know, nothing's happening. And, and this comes on the heels of the, the litigation that, that came out of the, um, the dispensary mess, right? This was in all September. And so uh, some of you may recall seeing some of the officials, Governor Pritzker, Tori Hutchinson, right? Some of the officials who came out and said in mid-September when they resolved the, the um, dispensary litigation, um, there were questions being asked about, well, what about the craft grower and the infusers? When are those coming out? And there was references made to, we're done with those reviews. The licenses and the scores will be issued in the next couple of weeks. Well, that didn't happen. And so it just got to be long enough and we weren't hearing anything from, and none of you heard anything from the Department of Agriculture or the state about what the status was. So we decided, um, the Illinois Craft Cannabis Association um, decided that we would reach out to the Department of Agriculture and the governor, um, and we would make a demand upon them. And as part of that demand, we would say, look, we don't want to file a lawsuit. That isn't, that isn't helpful to anybody, um, but we're going to have to. You're forcing our hand. We have uh, members that and applicants that are losing property, that are bleeding cash, having to hold on to these properties. This just is untenable. Uh, it wasn't the intent of the, of the statute. And frankly, you're doing other things, right? I mean, it's not as if you can't get the scores out. Just give us the scores. Tell us where we sit so that we can make business decisions going forward. Um, so uh, we reached out to the Department of Agriculture and the state, and we actually gave them, <laughs> um, we gave them a copy of a lawsuit that we were going to file if they didn't actually take some steps. Uh, we had some, what I, we deemed as productive conversations, but they were never willing to commit. And so we ended up having to file a lawsuit. And so several weeks ago, we filed a um, suit on behalf of the Illinois Craft Cannabis Association. And really the, the point of the association and the lawsuit was so that individual applicants didn't have to name, didn't have to come out and say, hey, we're here, we're applying for a, an application, and then we're also suing you. Um, it's, it's different, it's a little bit different in the dispensary scenario where 
you know, the um, licenses that have already been issued. Uh, here, we're all still applicants. And so, you know, it's not, it's not, people don't feel as comfortable actually giving their name out. And so it made sense for the association to step in on behalf of the applicants and, and do this. So we filed a lawsuit. Um, we asked for, uh, we are asking for a, again, a writ of mandamus. This came up earlier with, uh, with the dispensary discussion. Um, and the mandamus asked for the court to compel the state and the Department of Agriculture to issue the scores and the licenses immediately without any more delay. Um, after we filed the lawsuit, the Department of Agriculture updated their website to state that there will be a third round of deficiency notices coming, and you'll remember this from when we talked about it earlier, in the coming weeks. Again, they like to use that, that term, which means we don't know when, but it's coming. Um, well, look, the Department of Agriculture through KPMG issued deficiency notices in July. Some of you may have received them. They issued a second round of deficiency notices on the craft grower and infuser applications in August. Some of you may have received those. And then they went silent. Um, and then we heard in September that they were done scoring and that, that we were gonna receive our licenses uh, in the next couple of weeks when that didn't happen. And now all of a sudden in response to the lawsuit, we're hearing that a third round of deficiency notices is, is still to go out from the Department of Agriculture, maybe through KPMG. Uh, we don't know, they haven't told us. So we, um, in our first hearing with the judge uh, on this mandamus request, and by the way, we're not only are we asking the court to uh, issue an order compelling that the scores and licenses be issued, but we're also asking the court for injunctive relief that would um, relieve the applicants of some of the, the obligations under the statute that are causing such pain and harm, uh, financial harm and difficulty, um, like maintaining a, a property. So you don't necessarily, we're asking the court to, to not allow the, the state to, um, to ding you on your application if you don't have, if you couldn't hold your property for these additional five or plus months that are gonna go on that are gonna continue to go on. Um, things like that, things like um, um, once you get the license, having a, a six months to, to start growing. Um, we're now into the winter months. And so for those of us that actually are lucky enough to get a license, we may not be able to start construction and start um, a growing cycle within that first six months. You know, that, that's just a product of the delays that have occurred. Uh, another issue that's arisen um, for those of us that are applicants with um, employees under the social equity um, option, social equity applicant option to have 51% or more of your employees qualifying as social equity applicants, the obligation under the law was to maintain those employees on staff during the entire review process. And that's another five plus months. And so, so there's, there's been that issue too. So there are a number of issues that we're asking for relief, but, but primarily and, and, and initially I would say, give us the scores and the licenses. Let's see where we sit at this point. So again, we can make these business decisions and then determine what type of additional relief we need. Um, the judge initially felt that uh, a, a, a an immediate ruling was not proper and that it was more proper to have, to allow the state to respond. And he gave the state some time to respond. The state actually did respond to our, to our uh, requests last week. Um, and the judge then agreed with us that he would expedite the mandamus issue and hear and hopefully rule quickly on the mandamus issue next week. So on Tuesday, the 24th, we are scheduled to have uh, an argument with the court as to whether or not the court will issue uh, a mandamus order compelling immediate scoring and issuance of the licenses. Um, we don't, you know, that, that mandamus order can take uh, a number of different forms. So while we're asking for it to be issued without delay, it could be denied outright, 
It could be issued with uh, some delay, some additional delay. It could be issued with conditions. Uh, that's not our request, but judges have um, discretion to, to enter orders that they deem appropriate. So, so we will see, but the good news is we're going to be getting some type of um, hearing and presumably decision next Tuesday, um, the 24th. And then we'll see from there and, and the court's going to um, hold off on the, the, the issue that we raised with respect to the relief, the injunctive relief until after there's a decision made on the mandamus. You know, the best news would be mandamus is granted with a very short period of time and we get our scores and, and licenses issued, um, you know, maybe before Thanksgiving or shortly after that, that would be terrific. Um, but we'll see and uh, stay in touch and, and we'll figure it out. I can't remember if, if that answered the question. I think there was a question about the timing of the, of the case. And by the way, to my knowledge to date, there hasn't been any other lawsuit filed yet with respect to this issue for craft brewers and, and infusers. And it kind of makes sense. I mean, this, our lawsuit preempts licenses having been issued because the delay is just, as I said, it's been untenable. It's been over five for almost five months uh, without a legitimate basis. And the other lawsuits on the dispensary side followed the issuance of the licenses. So that's why there were more and they took on a little bit different um, uh, different claims that were being made. Right now, we're just, we just want our scores. Mm -hmm. uh, the first part of the question was answered, which was when you're returning to court. So we know it's on the 24th, which is a week from today. Yes. And then um, the second part was, will it be uh, viewable? Um, <clears throat> I'll have to get back to you on that. I'm not sure. Okay. This is, um, and the reason I'm not sure is because this is, um, we are, we are in front of a new judge. He's not a new, um, he's been a judge for a while, but he's, um, new to this courtroom, this division, he moved over from a different division. Um, and I don't, he hasn't posted or created his, um, his own courtroom rules yet. And so I won't find out at some point this week, I suspect whether or not it will be an open uh, hearing, it's going to be over Zoom, uh, okay. not be in person. Um, but to the extent it is um, ac accessible by others, um, I'll, let, I'll let you know. And Okay. And I'll definitely let everyone else know. Yeah. Uh, okay. Some follow-up questions. Uh, so it seems that those applicants who had acquired their zoning and applied for special use by application submittal will now no longer have that as an advantage. Is that how you see it? Well, it depends, I suppose, um, because we're not, we're not really sure how things are going to play out. Um, I, I, I do agree, and conceptually, I, I agree with the the statement. I do think that, you know, had everything played out the way it should have, um, you know, in a perfect non-pandemic, non-delayed world, um, we would have, we would have received our scores and licenses uh, July 1st, and certainly the zoning, permitting, those that, that were, you um, able to do all of that initially were benefited. Um, just because if you couldn't, then, then, you were, then you were behind the, you know, behind the, uh, uh, you, your, your application wasn't complete. And so you, you weren't in the right, in the same position. <laughs> uh, so, you know, yes, there's an, there was an advantage. Now, did you lose that advantage by the delay? It seems like that's possible uh, because it seems like irrespective of what happens with the pending lawsuit or any subsequent lawsuits that may come after the uh, scores and licenses are issued, it does seem like the Department of Agriculture and the state um, appreciate the struggles that applicants have um, dealt with as a result of 
the pandemic and the delays. Um, they've said that repeatedly. Um, they being the, the state officials have said, we, we understand the challenges. Um, we understand the, the hardships. We wanna do everything we can to make it equal and, and right and to make sure that everybody has, uh, you know, is coming from, from the same footing and the same playing ground. So um, I think the state is going to do, although they haven't yet, I do think the state and the department are going to do what they feel is appropriate to kind of even the field and reduce the harms and the challenges that were brought about in the last five, six months. But I don't know how they're going to do that yet. And I don't know what that's going to look like. So, you know, I'm not sure it's as simple as saying, uh, if you had your, if you if you had your zoning and your permitting, you know, do you lose that advantage? I, I still think there hopefully will be some you know, advantage there, some benefit to you. Uh, but I do think there is going to be some type of leveling of playing field. I, I do think the state's going to do that. Okay. Uh, next is what about transporter licenses? Yeah, the old transporter licenses, you guys are always getting forgotten about. Um, you know, the, the transporter license for, for most of the, of the scenario fall in line with the, the craft grower and the, and the infuser. Um, it's a little bit different uh, for various reasons. First of all, it's um, unlimited licenses. So there isn't the, the same um, competitiveness that there is for the other two. Um, and there wasn't the requirement to actually secure property. So there isn't, you know, presumably um, there isn't the, the financial hardships that the others are experiencing. My guess is that the transporting licenses are going to fall in line with whatever happens with the, the craft grower and the infuser. Um, I certainly wouldn't expect that they jump out ahead and I don't expect that they're going to fall behind. I just think they're going to fall in line like the, tail of the dog um you know it's just gonna it's just they're all, all three i expect and this could change but i expect that all three will uh kind of follow the same path whatever that path is going to be down the road and by the way just just to to, to follow up on that there's been no um there's been no statement, there's been no argument, there really hasn't been anything that's come out of the, the lawyers for the department or the state in this lawsuit or anything that I've seen that has separated the transporting licenses from the craft grower and the infuser in any way. So, you know, that's, that's one of the reasons that I say, I just expect them all to kind of follow the same path. Okay. Next question is, should we infer any outcome for our application if we have not received any deficiency notices? No, you know, that's a question that's been asked from day one, right? Is it, a, is it good news that I didn't get a deficiency notice or is it good news that I did get a deficiency notice? Um, and I don't know that you can infer uh, one way or another. Um, I will say this, the fact that, that you haven't received a deficiency notice, you know, subsequent to in, in the last, let's call it six weeks um, or eight weeks, um, I, I, you shouldn't read anything into that uh, because that none have been issued. None have been issued for, I mean, unless they came out today and I haven't heard about them yet, um, none have been issued for either the, the supplemental dispensary or this third round of deficiency notices for the craft grower infusers that we're hearing about. Um, so no one should have received any for those. The fact that you didn't receive a deficiency notice in the initial rounds, you know, months ago, um, who knows? Who knows? I, I can't tell you. There, the, this goes back to the kind of the lack of transparency um, and the lack of communication. We don't know. There's so much information that we don't know as applicants, as um, lawyers for applicants, as consultants, you know, um, people involved in the industry. Uh, we just don't know, we don't know how KPMG was told to review these uh, applications. 
We don't know who's you know, actually reviewing the applications. Uh, we don't know who's making decisions after they come out of KPMG, you know, what's happening with the applications. Um, and frankly, we're not getting a lot of information from the departments themselves. Look, we all know it's a struggle. This is a, this is a big job, right? The, the IDFPR and Department of Agriculture, they took on a lot, um, but they took it on. It was an aggressive approach. The legislature gave us a, a thick, complex law. Um, we all, you know, it has had some, some great intent, some great um, things for uh, social equity and reformative justice and other states are looking at our process and our law and, and, and wanting to emulate to the extent they should. Um, and now we got to deal with it. And so, you know, the agencies need to step up now and at the very least be transparent, let us know what's going on, give us some information. Today, we're not getting it, but, right. and that's part of the struggle. And that's why a lot of my answers ultimately, and very good questions from everybody, but a lot of my answers to you and my clients are, we just don't know right now as we sit here because we don't have all the information. Right, and I'll add to that because some of you might've chimed in after we were having our early on conversation, which is not only is there a lack of transparency from the state with communicating to those of you who are applicants and with the general public, but there's even lack of transparency in the state with communicating across state organizations and departments, you know. Um, I had a meeting, I was on a meeting with the CEO last week with all of the technical assistance providers for this particular program. And this came up as a point of conversation because we don't even know what's going on. So how can we provide assistance and help and even be able to plan for what comes next if we don't know what's going on. And the, the people from DCEO who are running this program basically were saying, we communicated with you as soon as we get information and even acknowledge, and I'll give you this as an example, there was one particular instance, one of these announcements that came out that David already brought up, I informed DCEO that the announcement came out. So, and she acknowledged that in that conversation, like, well, you know, one of those Trisha told me about. So, and that's because I have Sunette, who's my assistant, who's also on here as a panelist and has probably been on chat with you guys, has, I have it as one of her tasks daily is to check the website. Check the website every day, check the website multiple times a day because nobody knows what's happening. And the only way for us to be on top of things is if we're actually just looking for it to, for whenever it happens. Cause it's like, it's manna falling from heaven or something. Like that's just the, the place that we're at. So we all feel your pain. Um, and you know, we're all doing whatever we can to advocate for you guys, you know, so David and his team is doing it from the legal perspective, you know, having taken on this litigation and, and being in communication and being proactive to try to advocate for something happening. I'm also doing it, you know, on the back end from an administrative perspective to say to DCO, well, can you find out this from, from Department of Ag? Can you find out this from IDFPR? And I've been asking this question going all the way back to July, you know, when it first came out that all of this was gonna be delayed. Well, what does this mean for us? How is it supposed to work? Can you please find out this? And I know that I've been, you know, a beating what feels like a dead horse, but, um, um, you know, in hopes that if I keep asking that eventually somebody will answer the question. So um, just know that, that was a long vent, <laughs> just enough that we, to say that we feel your pain. Um, so next question is, so, or may, actually statement. So now money spent on zoning and special use was wasted as others did not have to spend it. Yeah, that, 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 is, that is very, very possible. Yeah. Look, I, you know, we don't know ultimately how these licenses and the scoring for, for the craft growers and infusers are going to play out. Um, it, the, the properties still need to be zoned. Ultimately, there needs to be zoning. And so 
it's just gonna, it's, it's most importantly is taking the next step. And that next step is getting our, getting the scores, finding out mm -hmm. what's, you know, where, where the review is, is at. They said they were done with the review uh, back in September. So what's going on? Um, but yeah, that statement is, is very possibly accurate. And by the way, let me also say too, um, for future reference, the lawsuit that's on file right now on behalf of the association is um, not asking for redress for any, app, any individual applicant. So to the extent you feel like you have been financially harmed or wronged or have a cause of action personally uh, as an applicant against the department or the state or whoever, um, you still hold that potentially. And, and look, hopefully there's gonna be 40 licenses issued uh, for craft grows and 40 for infusers. And, and um, I wish uh, the best for every applicant uh, but some of you aren't going to get a license. Some of you aren't going to get that top score or a high enough score in this round. And if you feel that there's um, a cause of action that you have, um, you still have that that right to to try to seek redress there. So. Okay. Um, okay. So next person has like three questions in one. So I'll just let you answer each individually. What if the veteran scoring issued was handled the same for craft growers as for dispensaries? Is your writ too soon? I didn't understand that last part, but I think the question is, um, can we have the same situation with the veteran issue for the craft growers and infusers that we did with the dispensaries? Um, the answer to that is it's unlikely because the craft grower and the infuser applications uh, and the scoring is different from the dispensary scoring. It, first of all, it's a multiple of four times. And so when you spread out the points and there's more points, there's less chance of the, the, all of the uh, top 40 being ties. And, and the only reason that the veteran issue came out the way it did in the dispensary round is because all of the top scores were tied perfect scores. It's much less likely that the uh, craft grower and the infusers will have 40 perfect scores at the top or more, 40 or more. Um, so that argument that a veteran owned company was required in order to get a license is much less likely to occur. It could happen, but, but it's much less likely. Okay. Um, the next part was, what have you learned, if anything, about this judge's views about around cannabis? <clears throat> Great question. That's always the first thing as a litigator we're looking for is, who's this judge? What has he done before or she? And, you know, what, what do they stand for? And what are their beliefs? All that. Um, not much, because, as I said, uh, this particular judge is relatively, well, he's, he's new to this division. Um, and so, and when I say this division, so um, the, the claims for relief that we're seeking in this particular part of the circuit court of Cook County are unique to this, to where this judge is now sitting. And so he didn't have to consider claims like we're making now in his prior judge life. And so um, unlike some other judges, you know, where we'll go up and we'll go and look at their history in terms of ruling on particular issues, we don't have a track record here. Okay. I don't know if that's good or bad, um, right. but, but it is what it is. And um, we'll see. I will tell you this. I was in the client, the Illinois Craft Cannabis Associ Association, um, were happy with his initial consideration of what was put before him. This was last, uh, last week. Um, and what was put before him was, if I wasn't clear earlier, um, our request that he hear the mandamus issue expedited, meaning right away, so next week. Um, he didn't have to do that. Uh, he, you know, one of the most important things for a judge is that he or she will review and read and consider um, everything that's put in front of them. 
And so, you know, that's the first and really most you can ask for a judge and of course to be impartial and uh, to rule um, in accordance with precedent and, and, and in accordance with the, the arguments that are being put before him or her. But um, the initial step that we took with this judge, um, we were happy. And so far, I think we're gonna get, um, we're gonna get uh, a good consideration, let's put it that way. Okay. And then the last question from this person is, if the applicant is successful and has been moving forward in Chicago with the zoning process, but now doesn't have the property, will any relief be given to start over with new property without incurring additional fees? Stay tuned. We don't know, <laughs> right? This right. is one of the things that, you know, we don't know. We, we, so let me, and let me say this too. Um, I expect based on what the department has uh, intimated and suggested and in everything that they're saying about wanting to make sure that, you know, everyone is kind of treated fairly. I expect that um, if you lost property or you lost the ability to, to get zoning during the course of time that there was delay as a result of the, the governor's emergency orders. I expect that you will not be financially um, harmed or that your application will not be um, um, deemed you know, unfit as a result. I expect that the state is going to do something, maybe multiple things that will allow for um, some redress to those that um, were harmed in that sense. But we don't know. They haven't made suggestions yet or made any offers yet. They haven't even given us the scores yet. So we don't know how this is going to play out. But they've, they've made it pretty clear that they want to do, you know, the right thing to correct any harms that have occurred as a result of the delays. And certainly that would be one of them. Right. If you had property that you lost as a result of the delay, and you can show that, if you had zoning or had the or were unable to obtain the zoning um, permits, you know, as a result of the delay, and you can show that, I'm speculating that the state is going to do something for you in that scenario. It's speculation, though. We don't know yet. Okay. Next question, for clarification, if we hypothetically have a perfect score other than military ownership, is the state allowing adjustment of ownership percentages to meet the qualification? No. No, there won't be, there won't be an opportunity to change ownership and change the structure. Um, the, the, the IDFPR said that specifically, actually, if you go and look at their September 22nd notice that's on the website. Um, it's somewhere, I think it's down towards the bottom, but it's one of the things that they state is that that will not be uh, an option. You cannot change ownership. I think there's an exception for um, if there's a death in the ownership structure during the delay period. But other than that, and certainly not to restructure based on veteran owned or not. Okay. Next question is, how many craft growers belong to the association and how many are part of the plaintiff group? Where are the plaintiffs primarily located? Was that, was that a second one at the end? Where are the plaintiffs are primarily located? Yeah, um, I don't currently, I haven't kept in, on top of how many members of the association, but I, will, I can find out and and get you the information. You know, it's okay. it's increasing daily. Maybe right. not daily. It's increasing um, as people hear about the association, which really came into being. Uh, I'm going to guess end of October or so. You know, it hasn't been around mm -hmm. all that long. Um, but there are, I don't know. I think when we filed suit, I'm going to guess around 35, 40 members, maybe more. Um, and as I said, more come on board. Uh, as every day passes. So, um, and I would encourage applicants to at least reach out 
and talk to the principals of the association uh, to see what um, what they're offering. They're terrific people, and you know, and have uh, you know have everyone's um, interests uh, in line. And so, I would, as I said, I would encourage people to reach out. And whether you join or not is that's up to you. But at least you know, making the contacts and the connections, and you know, the more we can move forward as 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 a group here. Mm -hmm. uh, better and i've actually been in touch with um one of the founders of this particular group as well as founders of some other groups um so one of the things i might do is give all of the groups an opportunity to have a session where everybody talks about what their groups are doing and what they're offering so on and so forth so um that's actually probably a good idea i can do that from the perspective of just saying hey these are the groups that are out here um and how and yeah so i'll work on that make a note to myself good idea yep um aren't okay next question aren't ties going to be more likely if they issue a third round of subsequent deficiencies hmm. that's a great point i hadn't considered that um yes i think that's fair to say because the more opportunities uh, applicants have to increase their scores closer to perfect, the more likely it seems to me they're going to be more perfect scores. So um, I, as I said earlier, because of the scoring and the different scoring in the craft grower versus uh, the dispensaries, I, I do not anticipate that there will be 40 or more perfect scores. That would surprise me. Um, but yes, I do think to your point, every opportunity there is to increase your your overall score makes it more likely that there that there will be ties. Um, I look. I'm not. Um, we're not suggesting in the in the lawsuit that's filed that there be another round of deficiency notices. There not be another round of deficiency notices. All we're saying because you know if they want to, if ultimately the Department of Agriculture wants to take the approach that the IDFBR took and issue a what are they calling a supplemental deficiency notice round after licenses are issued to craft growers and infusers, that's up to them. That's a whole different scenario. We don't have our scores yet. So mm -hmm. we don't even know what it looks like. And so, you know, our, our position is, you know, we, we don't have, we don't have time for another round of deficiency notices. You can do, you can do rounds and rounds as long as you want. It's not going to correct issues if there are issues, you know, just issuing another round of deficiency notices before the scores come out aren't going to correct issues. And, and let me be clear, we don't know if there are going to be issues. Just because the, the dispensary um, results ended with issues there doesn't mean that the craft grown infuser results are going to have the same issues. It's speculative. Right. So let's get the scores out. Let's get the licenses, um, uh, the scores and the licenses issued, and then let's see how it how it plays out. And if there's lawsuits that follow that, so be it. If there's a supplemental deficiency notice round that the Department of Agriculture feels is necessary, fine. They'll make a they'll make a, an informed decision after the scores are out. But it may actually work out just fine without you know, much litigation or much, much uh, of the issues that we saw at the, at the dispensary uh, round. So we just want the scores. Yep. Okay. So Timothy is saying that his previous question uh, was pertaining to Crafter, which I think he asked again. So I'll get to that in a second. Mm -hmm. uh, let me dismiss that. Okay. So next is, I thought you could change address without a problem. So it's, um, I wouldn't say it's without a problem. Um, <laughs> you can't do much without a problem. Uh, it's all perspective, I suppose. <clears throat> but uh, there is, there is a, a mechanism to ask the Department of Agriculture to change your location. Um, after, this is subsequent to licenses being awarded. And I think that's actually something that they 
uh, put on their website after we filed the lawsuit was there are mechanisms through the regulations that will allow you to request a new location. But that doesn't, um, that doesn't take the place of the statute that specifically states you need to have um, you, the property that you, that, you, that you apply with, you need to have in order to get the license. So, you know, that's a little, there's some nuance there to your question. Yes, you can ask to change your location, but that's after the licenses are awarded, technically. Now the, the department is talking about, the Department of Agriculture is talking about, and I think they're kind of being a little, kind of riding the fence a little bit on their, in my opinion, on their um, website and making it seem like if you don't have your property and it's a new address and you get your license awarded, don't worry, you can, there's a way to do it. Um, I would still be worried because first, you know, what they say, what they say on their website is a little confusing, number one, um, and what they say on their website isn't law, number two. So it's not, it's not set in stone yet. It, and if I'm reading between the lines on your point, it's kind of like, well, if they, if they're, if they follow what they implied on their website, then it opens the door for somebody to follow uh, file litigation that says, well, wait a minute, this is not what the law says, and you're not actually following the law. That is one issue they're concerned with, for <laughs> sure, because they saw what happened in the dispensary round. They don't want the lawsuits. Who would? I mean, we can't blame them for that. Right. Um, but to my point earlier, just issuing another round of deficiency notices isn't going to necessarily save them from, from that. So, right. We'll but you're right. They, they want to do everything they can to not be sued. And, and look, I believe them when they say they want it all to be, to work out and be smooth and everyone to, you know, to, to have the same um, opportunities. Uh, it's, it's a big challenge and they just need to, to get to it. Yes, absolutely. So next question. It was my understanding IDFPI was over dispensary, not craft grow this, that is accurate. So for craft grow, if we hypothetically have a perfect score other than military ownership, is it possible the DOA will allow adjustment of ownership? Is it possible Department of Agriculture will allow adjustment of ownership? Um, adjustment of ownership will be allowed after licenses are awarded. And I shouldn't say will be allowed. You can seek, you know, they have to be approved, certainly. So you can seek um, approval from the department to change your ownership, but not in order to get the license. In other words, you cannot change your ownership structure before the licenses are awarded. I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be able to get more points um, in your application that is currently, in, you know, with uh, being reviewed by the department by changing the ownership structure at this point. After the licenses are awarded, then you can seek a change. Okay, please share the association info and the court info to join hearing. That's the request. Yeah, I'm sorry, the association information? Uh-huh. And then also the court information to join hearing. So we don't know the court information yet. We'll know that later because we're waiting on the judge. Right. And then the association information. How about you send that to me and I'll send that to everybody? Perfect. Okay. So we'll share after the webinar. And let me tell you, it is very prompt about emailing information and very thorough with information. And I really do appreciate that because you don't have to be, you know, that's not a billable hour. So <laughs> uh, if we are awaiting a new round of deficiencies, wouldn't that only prolong our licenses being issued? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you come to Which, court with me when we're making our argument. <laughs> and this is why we have the lawsuit now. Right. Well, part actually, that was actually the lawsuit was filed before that happened. Yeah, yeah, it's part of the reason. I mean, it's an yep. overall 
it's an overall delay um, without sufficient basis is really mm -hmm. what it is. The governor delayed back in late June, he delayed the July 1st deadline based on his authority under, <clears throat> as the governor under the Illinois Emergency Management Agency Act to declare emergencies. And we've all, I'm sure, been reading about the different challenges to his uh, limitation of his authority by the restaurants and the public gatherings and, you know, all the other things that are being challenged um, around the state. Um, this challenge happens to be um, one in which he has, through this particular executive order, um, indefinitely suspended a statutorily mandated deadline of July 1st. And under, I'm getting a little into the weeds here, under the Illinois Emergency Management Agency Act, the governor actually has to have some basis for that indefinite suspension. If he's going to suspend a statute, it need, he needs to show how it actually hinders his dealing with the pandemic. And maybe for the restaurants, he can show that. I'm not taking a position on that. But not for scoring applications that presumably were done in September. Mm -hmm. and there's nothing there that hinders his dealing with the pandemic. So the score should be issued. And that, that's kind of the basis of our mandamus argument. Next question is, so is it better to change address now or after you receive the license? That's after you receive the license, I suspect, based on what you said previously. Well, you know, there, that's a really good question because there are, I, I don't know how many, but there are definitely people out there and maybe the questioner is one of them um, that what aren't able, weren't able to hold the property that they applied with. Mm -hmm. What do you do now? Um, do you go out and find a piece of property immediately? Um, and, you know, I don't have the right perfect answer for a couple of reasons. Number one, the Department of Agriculture hasn't given us guidance, right? They haven't told us, here's what you should be doing. Um, number two, everybody's a little bit different. And so, you know, I wouldn't want to give you advice. I'm happy to give you advice if you contact me individually, but I don't know the you know, specifics to your uh, situation. So it's, it, one, one um, counseling doesn't, doesn't fit all necessarily. Um, but I will say again, and this goes back to um, what you read on the Department of Agriculture's website right now, and what they've been saying generally is that um, we will find a way to make it work. And so um, if you're in a position I don't know if this is your position, but if you're in a position where you lost property and you no longer hold or secure the property that you applied with, I would generally state that you hold off and don't, don't necessarily go out there and secure another piece of property just yet, because it sounds as if the department is going to find a way to score all the applications as they came in back in March with those properties and to the extent one of the 40 or 80 of the total licenses that are issued for craft growers and infusers don't have that particular property, I don't think they are going to hurt you if you lost the property due to the delay. That's my speculation. Um, and that's, again, that's just a general statement that I'm getting from what I'm hearing from, from the department. They haven't come out and specifically said, go out and find a new piece of property. Okay. All right. Uh, the, the person tried to follow up and just said the situation is that we found a more affordable building during this delay. So. Be very careful. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go changing the application just yet. Not until, not until, uh, and by the way, you're free to reach out to the Department of Agriculture through an email and ask them the question. Good luck getting a response. Mm -hmm. um, if you've tried that, you know what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. uh, but you're free to try. And maybe they're a little more, since the lawsuit, maybe they're a little more receptive. Maybe they'll give you an answer. 
Maybe there's something there that you can rely on. Certainly you can someday, if you need to, at least point back to an email that you sent to them asking for some advice and some uh, guidance based on the position that you're in. So there's nothing wrong with reaching out to them. In fact, I, I encourage it. Okay. Um, next question, with change of ownership after licenses are awarded, doesn't that mean businesses will just load their applications for points and immediately change after? Well, I hope not. Um, that's not the intent. And when I said earlier that you can't just, it doesn't come without, I don't know if I use the word problems or not, but um, you still need to get approval. And this is new for all mm -hmm. of us and new for the agencies, but I can tell you that they've said from day one, for any changes to applications subsequent to licenses being issued, they are going to be diligent in making sure that these are, you know, aren't done for improper reasons. Um, I can tell you right now, I have experience, I, I have clients that are license holders in Illinois um, under the medical program and, and we have, we have been through that process in trying to change whether it's location, ownership structure, I mean, you name it. Um, they are thorough and they don't just, it's not a rubber stamp and they, it, it's, it's a challenge. And so to the, to the question, um, it's just not easy. And I don't think um, it's a good business model to suggest uh, or th that a business is going to just try to do something and load up in a particular application, get a license and then change everything. It's just not going to fly. Um, there might be some strategy uh, to doing, you know, a little bit here or there, but um, I, I don't expect to see uh, what I would consider to be advantages taken of the system. Okay. Regulators have been pretty, um, pretty on top of things once the okay. license were issued. And then it looks like we have one last question. Um, I think this is meant to say, is there a finite way to find a change address after licenses are awarded? Is there a way to, I'm sorry, to find a way to? Is there a, a finite, a specific way to find to change address after license awarding? Well, currently there is. Currently there's a regulation that allows for um, a request for a change. Um, but based on everything that's happened over the last, you know, with the delays and the challenges related to having to secure property and applicants losing property and losing the zoning, et cetera, um, I suspect that's going to change somewhat. <clears throat> and I'm not sure how. Um, again, I, you know, I'm sorry that there's, there's a lot of just unknowns here, but um, I, I do think that there will be changes to that, whether it's a new regulation or, um, or just a revision to that. Or, but, but I do think that you know, while, while there may be, while yes, there is a provision that allows you to seek approval for a change right now, I do think that'll change probably to make it a little bit easier for those that, that um, encountered the difficulties related to the delays. So I would stay tuned on that. Let's see what happens. Okay. And those are all of the questions. Um, and I'm happy to take, you. yeah, I'm happy. Like if somebody emails you or wants to email me directly, that's fine. I'm happy to answer questions at any time. Let me check chat for a second. Um, oh yeah, the question has already been asked in q and So thank you so very much. Um, I also, if anybody has a question, this came up uh previously if anybody has questions concerning things like records and expungements and things like that i actually referred someone to you i think it was last week or a week prior 
um, to say, you know, this is a good source for that information because that was an email exchange that we had. So I then told the person, hey, go call this law firm and they might be able to help you. Um, so um, if you have questions about anything, you can definitely, uh, you see that David is a, a very knowledgeable, thorough, helpful resource. Obviously he's doing a lot of work to help not just the people that are in ICCA, but at the end of that, end of the day, really all of you, because right, right. what happens with ICCA affects all of you. Um, and so please add us to uh, your list of people <laughs> that you notify about what's going on with the lawsuit. Uh, um, so thank you very, very much for all of your time today and for all of the thorough information that you have shared. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks for everybody who participated. And uh, thank you, Tricia. All right. Thank you. So have, have a good rest of your day. You too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.